Today we will be talking about the paranasal sinuses. The sinuses are paired air-filled cavities in the bone of the skull. They are lined with mucous membranes. The sinuses are named for the bones in which they sit. Frontal, sphenoid, ethmoid, and maxillary sinuses. These communicate with the nasal cavity through openings in the lateral nasal wall. These are also very small in children. Function of the sinuses are to reduce the weight of the skull without minimizing the integrity. It helps to warm incoming air. It helps to add resonance to the voice and it provides mucus for the nasal cavity. Again, sinuses are named after the bones in which they are situated. Here's just a nice picture of the frontal, ethmoid, and maxillary. The sphenoid sinus is more posterior. So if we talk about the frontal sinuses, they're located in the frontal bone, just superior to the nasal cavity, midline above the eye. So you can, if you go right above the eye, that's where you can touch where the frontal sinuses are. They're asymmetrical two to three centimeters in diameter. Have you ever heard of a brain freeze? You know, when you have something cold like ice, ice cream? Well, that brain freeze is the feeling you get from eating ice cream is caused by the rapid cooling of the air in the frontal sinuses. The cooling triggers pain receptors, producing the brain freeze. Remember I had mentioned that part of the function of the sinus is to warm the incoming air. So basically that frontal sinus is trying to warm the air from the ice cream and it causes the pain receptors to give that little brain freeze. The sphenoid sinuses are located of course in the sphenoid bone. These cannot be palpated during an extra oral exam. These are the most posterior sinuses. They are frequently asymmetrical, 1.5 to 2.5 centimeters in diameter. They communicate and drain into the nasal cavity through an opening superior to each superior nasal concha. The ethmoid sinus sinuses, there's the number of them, they're very small and it's variable in number. They're divided into anterior, middle, and posterior ethmoid cells. The posterior cells open into the superior meatus where the anterior and middle open into the middle meatus of the nasal cavity. Again, like the sphenoid sinuses, these cannot be palpated during an extra oral exam. So again, if you're looking at the sinuses, the paranasal sinus above the eyes and the forehead near the midline, you can palpate that. Sphenoid would be the most posterior. Ethmoid, behind the medial wall of the eye orbit. The sphenoid and ethmoid, you cannot palpate during an extra oral exam. The maxillary sinus is important to us. It's the largest of the sinuses and it's the most important in dentistry. The boundaries of the sinus, are the roof is at the bottom of the orbital floor. The floor of the maxillary sinus, this is why it's so important to us in dentistry, is the upper surface of the alveolar process of each maxilla. Oftentimes if somebody has a cold, they may come in and say that they have discomfort in their posterior teeth. They cannot locate it to one tooth and oftentimes it could be because of sinusitis. The medial boundary is the lateral wall of the nasal cavity. Again, the reason why it's significant in dentistry is the size and close proximity to the maxillary teeth and maxillary bone. As I mentioned, inflammation can cause pain in the maxillary teeth. Infection in maxillary posterior teeth can perforate and extend into the sinus to, to produce a sinus infection called sinusitis. Think of any infection as itis, sinusitis. 
removal of root tips can be accidentally pushed into sinuses. So that's another precaution for us. So when you think of sinusitis, its pain and discomfort may indicate sinusitis, an inflammation or an infection of the sinus. Some symptoms include headache, pain in the forehead, upper jar and teeth ache, cheeks tender to touch. Ethmoid inflammation often causes swelling of the eyelids and tissues around your eyes, so inflammation of the ethmoid sinus can also cause tenderness when the sides of your nose are touched, a loss of smell, and a stuffy nose. Infection in the sphenoid sinus can cause earaches, neck pain, a deep aching at the top of your head. Inflammation in the sphenoid sinus does not occur as frequently. Each sinus has an opening into the nose for the free exchange of air and mucus, and each is joined with the nasal passages by a continuous mucous membrane lining. Therefore, anything that causes a swelling in the nose, an infection, an allergic reaction, or another type of immune reaction, also can affect the sinuses. Air trapped within a blocked sinus, along with pus or other secretions, may cause pressure in the sinus wall. The result is the sometimes intense pain of a sinus attack. Similarly, when air is prevented from entering a paranasal sinus by a swollen membrane at the opening, a vacuum can be created that can also cause pain. So when you're doing an extraoral sinus exam, when we're doing our extraoral exam, we do not include sinuses as part of our extraoral exam. However, if a patient comes in complaining of a cold and some discomfort, it may be a good idea to take a look and use by manual pal palpation and circular compression and that would be using your index and middle fingers. The frontal sinuses, as I mentioned before, is the midline above the eyes. The maxillary sinus is below the orbital bones. Pain and, dis pain and discomfort may indicate sinusitis, which is an inflammation and or infection of the sinuses. When palpating the maxillary sinuses, if gentle pressure does not produce discomfort, the percussion technique can be used. Now, our goal isn't to cause pain, but we're trying to find out what is causing discomfort. So if gentle pressure does not cause it, the percussion technique is when you leave your fingers in the same position and then take and thump with the middle finger of the opposite hand on top of it and this can accomplish the percussion technique to see if there's anything going on with the maxillary sinuses. So again, with the maxillary sinuses, if you have your hands below the orbital bone, take the hand from the other, from the opposite side, and use the middle finger just to thump. Probably heard a little tapping. Of course, I'm doing it as I'm talking. Now this is kind of neat. You may want to try this. If you take and darken a room and place, all you need is a, is a pen light on the maxilla. Have your patient open the mouth and look for an orange glow on the hard palate. A decreased or absent glow suggests sinus is filled with something other than air. So see how you do it? Just take and I'm going to go here for a moment. You know, most of us don't have an otoscope in our homes, but if you just take a pen light, put it where the maxillary sinus is, so put it below the orbital bones and have the patient open their mouth and take, to, take a look to see if you can see that illumination. If it's decreased, it may mean that there is some mucus involved. We've talked about septum before, so I just wanted to show you what it looks like when somebody has a deviated septum. 
So if you're a clinician and you view this, do you think that this deviation can cause difficulty with breathing? Do you think as a clinician will you have to modify patient positioning and or treatment? So something to think about if somebody has difficulty. You may be, have to be very careful when you retract the upper lip to make sure that you're allowing for adequate breathing. You may have to adjust the patient positioning. You may need to give frequent breaks. Okay, I also wanted to talk to you about the hyoid bone, which really has nothing to do with the sinus, but the hyoid bone is basically the skeleton of the tongue. It's found in the anterior region of the neck. In order to palpate the hyoid bone, what you'd want to do is basically locate the thyroid cartilage, which is your Adam, which is the Adam's apple, and place your fingers above, above the Adam's apple, and swallow. And that's where your hyoid bone is. Your hyoid bone is the floating bone. It does not articulate with any other bone. It's there for muscle attachment. Here's a picture of the hyoid bone. A uh, fun fact you may want to share at a party is if somebody were to be strangled, what actually happens is the hyoid bone breaks. And again, the hyoid bone is what is used for muscle attachment. And remember that it's a non-articulated horseshoe-shaped bone in the midline, inferior to the mandible. Again, it serves as an attachment point for the extrinsic muscles of the tongue, which we will be talking about in the next couple of learning units. As an accessory muscle of mastication, muscles of the pharynx. This is an important bone for the swallowing process. This helps to make sure that when you swallow, and what you swallow doesn't go into the respiratory tract. Again, I have a tendency to repeat myself. It's horseshoe shaped or U shaped. It has a body and two processes. There's the greater horn and the lesser horn. Greater horn is for the posterior. Lesser are on each side of the bone, bone excuse me, on each side of the bone, <laughs> each side of the body where it joins the greater horns. It's suspended from above by the stylohyoid ligament. Think about the hyoid bone and styloid process. The styloid process is on the temporal bone. It's attached to the thyroid cartilage by a ligament. It's the area of insertion for the suprahyoid and infrahyoid muscles. So think about those words. Suprahyoid would mean above the hyoid. Infrahyoid would be muscles below the hyoid. The area, it's also the area of origin for extrinsic muscles of the tongue and muscles of the pharynx. That concludes our paranasal.